Serpentology. Mm. This topic um, has revolutionized my, my, my thinking on many things. As a Christian, as a minister, as someone who has studied the Bible for many years, who has devoted his life to teaching the scripture and, and helping others understand the Bible, um, I think you're going to see just how important this topic is as we get deeper into this discussion. Because this is a subject, my friends, that again, like many of the others that we have been discussing so far, the enemy has tried to use this topic to pervert it, to twist it, uh, to try to skew its message in just the right way to cause deception in the minds and hearts of many people today, even many Christians. And today what we're simply doing is we're asking the question, as we have been through this entire seminar, what does the Bible actually say? What does the Bible teach in reference to this subject of death. And so what I want to do is I want to get right into this and just kind of open up with a, with a kind of a story. This happened to me about five or so years ago. And uh, I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. I, again, I told you I'm from Northeast Arkansas. And so uh, about, f- I don't know, five years ago or so in July uh, uh, of 20, I don't know, this might have been, I don't even know, it might have been actually four years ago. I think it might have been 2016 or might have even been 2017. I've been lost track of time. But it was in July of one of those years. I was actually preaching a live seminar just like this one. And just before the topic, this topic that I was going to be presenting, um, <laughs> I saw this article from my local news station, Region 8 News in Northeast Arkansas. And so I, I found this and notice what it says here. It's basically a picture. And then they posted this to their news social media site. And so here's what it says. They're asking a question, miracle witnessed? And then they tell about it. A truck driver took this picture as he passed by the scene of a fatal motorcycle crash, raising the question. And here's the question. What is that white shadow in the frame? And then they're asking the general public, of course, for response purposes, they're asking, what do you think it is? And so I'm going to let you kind of look at this, this picture for just a moment. Some of you are probably trying to say, what in the world? What, what shadow? What white shadow? And then some of you may actually be able to see it very clearly on the screen there. But I'm going to circle it, okay? The shadow that they're talking about is, okay, I'm going to open this up a little bigger here. The shadow they're talking about is right there. I hope you can see that little circle there. There's like a, a, a weird kind of translucent, cloudy, shadowy, uh, kind of image there in the picture. And so a truck driver drove by, he saw this from a distance and he snapped the picture. And this is what came up in the picture, obviously, was this shadowy, what appeared to be a shadowy uh, figure in the picture. And so obviously it sparked some, um, <laughs> it sparked some, some, some uh, ideas in many people's minds. Of course, the news station knew this. They knew that many people were going to automatically start giving their opinion and their feedback as to what they thought that it was going to be. It's actually a pretty cool tactic to get uh, people to respond because the more responses you get, the more the message gets out there. And so it was a very interesting thing indeed. Now, on this day, as I'm looking at this picture, I'm seeing this post. I was just curious. I don't usually spend too much time on Facebook these days, although sometimes I'll post something. I usually only use my Facebook or my social media accounts to uh, post, um, you know, faith related material or Bible related material just for the purpose of sharing my faith. And so sometimes I will take a little bit of time to answer and to respond and all that. But for the most part, I try not to spend too much time on Facebook, social media, because I have other better things to do. But on this particular day, when I saw this picture, and I'll pull it back up because there may be someone who just joined us. Uh, again, new station sent this and at this motorcycle, fatal motorcycle accident. And there's that white little substance there in the picture. Uh, let me go back to this here. Oh, excuse me. Uh, so there it is for those of you who might be seeing it. Now, when I saw this, I'm going, I'm, I'm start scrolling through the comment section because I was rather interested in seeing what are some of the spot responses from the community. And I kind of went into this knowing before I had started reading these comments, uh, obviously where I live, Southern Illinois, it's a part of the Bible belt of the South. I mean, there's a church on every corner of every street of every town. And so uh, I kind of just knew, kind of s- assumed that, you know, most of the comments were going to be religious in nature. And that was exactly the case. But as I'm going through, it just kind of confirmed 
what I have always known and assumed in my mind that most Christians believe about the concept of death and the afterlife, right? And so I'm going to actually show you right now. Now, I'm going to pull back up this picture with some little messages at the top because I took a screenshot of some responses that some of these people were giving in response to what they thought that this white shadowy substance was or this white shadowy figure was in the picture. Now, I've blocked out the name and the, and the, uh, the picture of the people so you can't see who they are because I want to respect their for the purpose of this, it's public. I want to respect that. But that being said, I, the, the message is public. I'm going to show you so this kind of, this represents a totality of the majority of the responses that was given to what they thought that this white shadowy figure was in the picture. So here we go. Starting with this comment, this particular person said, okay, in response to what that white shadowy translucent uh, image is in the picture, they said, giving up the ghost, <laughs> giving up the ghost. And of course, what they're talking about is they believe, as most of the people who responded to this on social media, uh, they believe that this, that white shadowy substance right, right in between those two ambulances, uh, kind of amongst the trees there, they believe that that is the ghost of that person that was leaving its body, right? If you go on, this next person said, spirit, no doubt. He is heading to heaven. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, spirit, no doubt, he is heading to heaven. Uh, and I've always been interested in this, not to try to be uh, critical or judgmental, but, you know, I've always been interested. You know, we live in a, we live in a day and time where people say, you know, uh, you, you know, don't judge me, right? Because when you're talking about someone and it seems like they're trying to condemn you of some kind, maybe even condemn you to hell, right? You'll hear people say, don't judge me. You know, you're not God. You can't play God, right? Only God can decide. But it's interesting how we're so quick to assume that when people die, they immediately go to heaven, right? What about those that, from the world's perspective, might not have been so good and they ended up in hell, right? Again, from the world's perspective. Uh, but it's interesting that this person is automatically assuming, as again, most of these Christians uh, and people who responded to this thread, spirit, no doubt, he is heading to heaven. So here's the next one. I think it is the spirit of the deceased person, all right? So this person thinks, again, it, that, that, that figure is the, sh is the spirit or ghost of the deceased person. And um, here's another one here. Looks like his spirit lifting from his body and returning to our heavenly father. And uh, okay, so you can go on to the next one. This person says, I believe in, notice how they start their statement. I believe in Jesus Christ. So th again, this, they're, they're associating what they believe this to be with their faith. So they're letting you know that right up. I believe in Jesus Christ. This is the spirit leaving this man's body. I firmly stand by that. So they're just simply stating, stating that there's no doubt in their mind that what that is, is the spirit of that deceased person leaving his body and going to heaven. And of course, I'll, I'll address that in just a moment. But I want to read the last one, which to me, this last one that I'm about to show uh, kind of sums them all up in a little bit more of a detailed way, because there were many other comments in this thread that reflected the same feelings, uh, the same sentiments that this next person shared. And this is what they said. And again, I'm quoting what they said. So notice what, it, what they say here. You can kind of sense the, the, the excitement and the, and the passion from this person's voice. They said, I swear, you can even show people proof like this and they still want to try and say, that's not what it is. Wake up, people. People just can't admit that God is real. We all have souls. Notice the language here. God is real, and we all have souls that are going somewhere when we die. But whatever makes you feel better, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so I'm showing that because, again, the majority of the people that I'm reading, and again, my friends, if, you could, if I could go back and show you this thread uh, of this post, there were hundreds and hundreds. And these, these opinions, these posts, these comments and responses reflected, I mean, comments and opinions from all the different counties in northeastern Arkansas. And I mean, I'm reading through these and I'm just baffled and just one after another. It's the spirit. It's the spirit. It's his ghost. It's leaving his body. He's going back to heaven. His soul is being liberated from his body. He's going back to our heavenly father. It's in you know, all these different. And so I show you that, my friends, because 
We live in a day and age, especially if you watch Hollywood and you read books and you watch television and you live in the day and age that we live in, we live in a time where people have lots and lots of opinions about the afterlife, about, you know, spiritism and what happens once a person dies, you know, where they go, or if they go somewhere, if they don't and all this. But what we're going to ask tonight is what does the Bible say? But before we do that, I just want to respond to kind of what was stated in those, in those, in those uh, statements that we just read. First of all, I want to clear something. As Christians, we have a moral responsibility and obligation that when we take on the name of Jesus, we've now become a representative of Jesus. You don't even have to be a minister. You don't have to be a preacher. You take on that representation and the name and the identity as a Christian, you're identifying yourself as that person that belongs to Christ. So when you say things, whether it's in public, whether it's in private or wherever you are, related to your faith, one of the main purposes of this Bible Prophecy Seminar, my friends, is to go to what the Bible says to clear out all of the confusion and simply bring light and, 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 and a spotlight back to what the Bible actually teaches. There are so many different differing opinions and ideas and perspectives out there about many different subjects. But when you go online or anywhere, publicly, privately, and you're communicating things, again, in faith, you know, I, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, and I firmly believe that this is what's happening. You're now communicating an idea to others that, oh, this person's a Christian, they must know what they're talking about. And if you don't know what you're talking about, the Bible then talks about how we can become stumbling blocks for others. And you don't want to be a stumbling block. We need to make sure that we got the facts. We need to make sure that we know what we're talking about and what we believe is in harmony with the Bible. Because again, you might have an opinion and you might be gung-ho, I mean, grounded in that opinion that you're sitting here right now telling me, Ryan, I believe this and there's no one that's going to change my mind. Well, uh, in some cases that may not be a bad thing, but in other cases it could be a horrible thing. Because if a person has grounded themselves in an opinion that is not necessarily backed by a thus saith the Lord in harmony across the board, but just on a flawed, uh, you know, skewed opinion that's not, again, lining up with the Bible, then you can be in danger of deception. And that's why we're presenting this topic tonight. Let me give you the facts about that accident that was in that picture. All these hundreds of Christians that I read from, you know, his spirit, his spirit's leaving his body. He's going, he's dead and he's going back to heaven. That was a fatal motorcycle accident. Yes. But the guy, actually, the person who had the accident at that site didn't die until they were at the hospital many, many hours later. So what was that image in the picture? Well, after further study, they found out that it was just simply a glare that appeared to look like perhaps to some people, some type of ghost-like apparition. But what did all those Christians say before they had the facts? They're communicating as if that is the spirit of the deceased person, the ghost of a deceased person, when in reality, that guy hadn't even died yet. And that's the kind of stuff we're talking about, my friends. We need to make sure that our faith and our opinions are grounded on the truth of God's word, because so many other people are going to go away believing something that may not be in harmony with the word of God, and that may not even be factual based on what you've said and what you've communicated. That's why it's important that we do, as the Bible says, study to show ourselves approved. Now, let's get into what the Bible teaches on this subject, because it is important. What we're going to do is go right to Genesis chapter 3. Because I've entitled this presentation Serpentology for a Reason. And we're going to see exactly what it mean, what I mean by serpentology. Let's go to the Bible right now. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now we know who the serpent is. After reading this and studying, this is no, none other than Lucifer himself, the devil, Satan, who has disguised himself as a serpent so that he can deceive Eve. Notice what the Bible continues to say. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. All right. So she's acknowledging, while she may not have all of the details right, because God didn't actually say that she couldn't touch it. 
His official message was she just better not eat it, right? But the fact that she's already entertaining a conversation with the enemy shows she's got her uh, she's got her details a little confused. But she acknowledges the fact that yes, God did indeed tell her that the day that she eats of this fruit will be the day that she will die. Now notice the response of the serpent. And the serpent said unto the woman, "Ye shall not surely." die. Okay. I'm just going to say it for the record. Many, many Christians today, God bless them, believe in what I'm calling serpentology. You see, when you go back to this story, Eve is, has entertained this conversation with the devil. And he's, you could just imagine the sarcasm as he's screaming from a distance as Eve may have been passing by the tree because he only could access her through the tree, right? So he, she's probably walking somewhat close to the tree. And I could just imagine his evil slithering voice coming from the distance. Hey, Eve, did I hear that God told you that you can't eat of all these trees in the garden? What in the world is he thinking? Why did he tell you such a thing? And I can imagine Eve walks over a little closer because she's just amazed by the fact that one of these animals can talk to her. Because I can't imagine that she probably talked to many animals. But this one can talk. Ooh, this is interesting. So she begins to clear it up. Well, you know, not, not, not really. I mean, God did say, yeah, he did say, but, you, but, but the truth is, you know, we can't eat of this tree or touch it, and, and let, but we'll die. And then, of course, here comes the lie. One of the, the very first lie recorded in scripture. Let me make that clear, my friends. The very first lie recorded in scripture. E, look, don't believe him. You're not really gonna die. Now, I have a question, my friends. Who is correct, God or the devil? And we know that obviously God was correct, that even though they did not die physically that day, there was a spiritual death that occurred, and they would have died physically that day had not Jesus stood up and became the sacrifice for them. That's why we've been reading Genesis 3.15. Remember, I will put enmity between you and the woman and her seed and your seed, and he shall, uh, you, you, you shall bruise his heel and he shall crush your head or bruise your head or crush your head. Okay, that scripture is a, is a forecast. It's a prediction. It's a prophecy pointing forward to Jesus Christ as the coming Messiah who would come as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. So they would have died literally that day had Jesus not stepped in and said, look, I'll die for them. But don't make any mistake, my friends. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's Romans chapter 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. And what did the enemy tell Eve? No, no, you're not really going to die. And so if you take that concept of we're not really going to die, no, you're not really going to die. What is he saying essentially? He's essentially saying you're immortal, that you're not ever really going to die. You're going to continue to live on and live on in some way, form, or fashion. You're going to live on. Now, my friends, I passed by a church sign. Uh, this was a few years ago, but I passed by a church sign, and this is what was on the church sign. It said, you will live forever. The question is, where? <laughs> And my question tonight, again, I'll read that one more time. The, the church sign said, you will live forever. The question is, where? Now, when I read that church sign, many people may be watching this right now, and they're thinking to themselves, yeah, yeah, I agree with that statement. Yeah, that's what I believe. Yeah, that's, that's what I've been taught. That's what I read in my Bible. Yeah, you, you will live forever. It's just going to matter whether you live forever in heaven or you live forever in hell. And so, again, that is the traditional popular evangelical Christian belief on the concept of death. But again, I go back. What? You're not really going to die. You will live forever. The question is where? But what did God say? That's the question we're asking tonight. What does the Bible teach? What does God teach about death? What did God himself say happens when a person sins? They will surely die. But yet the devil says, 
not really. You don't really die. You live forever, which is exactly what that church sign says. And the idea that we're simply communicating is the majority belief of Christians today, which is actually what I used to believe as a Christian many, many, many years ago. And the concept is very, um, to some people, very simple, but to me, it's a little convoluted and a little twisted. And that is the concept that Within each and every person, God has given a soul. He has given them or placed a soul or a spirit or some type of uh, 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 some type of uh, of conscious, aware, immortal, soul-like presence within a person. And so most Christians, and by this way, most of the world today, even in other faiths that are non-Christian, and those even of the uh, of, of those that are kind of more of a spiritualistic uh, faith that's not really, you know, a Christian as well, a lot of people believe that when a person dies at the point of death, their soul or their spirit, and you're going to hear me use those uh, words interchangeably tonight uh, from the perspective of the evangelical gospel, okay? And that is that many evangelical Christians, the majority of Christianity today, believes that when a person dies, that their soul or their spirit is simply liberated or separated or comes out of the body, as you kind of see in this picture here, as, the, as it's depicted in this picture, and then they will be separated, and then they will immediately find themselves in the presence of God, in which from there they will either receive eternal eternal life to dwell in heaven forever, or they will be damned to eternal hell fire to roast and toast for all eternity in the presence of the devil. Now, I want to be clear. And here's another picture too. Again, this is kind of the idea that when a person dies, their, their, their spiritual ghost, their spiritual soul is just going to float off into the heavenly abyss where it's going to find itself ultimately in two, uh, one of two places, either heaven forever or hell forever. And so again, what we're asking tonight is, is that what the Bible teaches? Now, right now, I want to encourage you to do something because this is vitally important. Some people have already decided what they believe in this topic. Nothing that I'm going to say past this point to some people because they have dug their heels in and they've decided this is what I believe and I'm just going to believe it. In that case, my friends, we have to understand that, you know, we have to be a teachable mind. We have to understand sometimes, you know, we have to be humble to say, Lord, is what I believe correct? Is what I believe in harmony with your word? And it takes a really, truly humble person to reach a point in their life where they can say to something that they're wrong about, I was wrong. That was me at one time. I used to believe this. I will, everything I've described up to this point, that's what I believed as a Christian. I was taught growing up in, in many different Pentecostal branches and faiths, as well as other evangelical faiths. I was, you know, I was once, you know, uh, studying and going to church with my Baptist friends, or my Methodist friends, Church of Christ, and I've went to several different non-denominational churches, studying to learn, to grow, to, you know, to have fellowship with other Christians. And this concept was taught to me and rooted and grounded in me from my youth up. And so this is what I used to believe. I remember when my when, when, when one of my loved ones died years ago, I was told as a kid, oh, you know, son, don't, don't worry, don't cry. You know, your, your, your loved one that has passed, uh, they've gone to be with Jesus. So the concept that their spirit, their soul is now with the Lord and they're up there in heaven with God. But I'm going to ask the question tonight, what does the Bible say? And what we're going to do first is we're going to study this from the perspective of how was man created first. We're going to look at that first. If we can determine how man was created, then we can determine uh, how man is taken out of this world. So let me say that one more time. If we can learn how man came into this world, how God brought him into this world and formed him and brought him in to be a living being, then we can also learn from scripture in the same way how God takes a person out of this world and how he kind of breaks apart that which he put together in the beginning for them to be a living person. We're going to see what the Bible teaches. So the question I'm going to ask now is, how was man created? And we go to Genesis chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Okay, so notice the words here. He formed his body from the dust of the ground. So there's his body. There's the shell. But in order for Adam, and this is Adam, of course, to become a living soul, to become a living being, 
He had to breathe into his, into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So notice what's on the screen here. There are two elements that must be combined or come together according to the Bible for a man to become a living soul, and that is body plus breath. And the question we're asking at this moment, what is the spirit? What is the soul? Many people kind of use those interchangeably as synonyms, as if they're the same thing. Uh, but I want to make it clear tonight, my friends, the soul and the spirit are not the same thing. In fact, you cannot have one without the other. And so what I'm going to show you now in the Bible, I'm going to go back to my slide here. Notice in order for a person to become a soul, that is a living soul, there has to be two elements combined, body plus breath. And remember the text of scripture said that Christ breathed into his what? His nostrils, the breath of life. And then Adam became a living soul. So what I'm gonna ask now is what, what, what is the spirit? What is the soul? And we're going to identify that very quickly with a few, a few texts. So we're going to go on to Genesis chapter 7, verse 21, talking about the flood, when God destroyed the world in the flood. Notice what it says here about these souls or these people that were there upon the earth. It says, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, all in whose nostrils, okay, that's the same word used over in Genesis 2, 7, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. And of course, it says, of all that was in the dry land, of course, they died. So this is the exact same language that is used in Genesis 2-7, that basically what's happening to these wicked people who did not get on the ark, who did not believe that Noah was telling the truth when, they, when he said God is going to judge the world and he's going to destroy the world. These wicked people, again, notice how it says God brought them and took them out of the world. Their bodies were there. They were living beings. But in order for them to be not living anymore, what did God do? It says here, it says, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. And so what eventually happened to them? They died. So something happened uh, dealing with the nostrils and the breath of life uh, that eventually ended in them dying. Let's continue on. Let's put the puzzle pieces together. This is coming from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. It says, cease ye from man whose breath, there it is again, is in his nostrils, same language, for wherein is he to be accounted of. So again, the same language used in Genesis 2, 7, breath and nostrils. But what you're going to find, my friends, is there's often language that is interchangeable in scripture that means the same thing. And I'm about to present that to you right now. Notice the context clues of Job chapter 27, verse 3. Job chapter 27, verse 3. And you will see this language used often in Scripture. It says, all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is what? In my nostrils. Notice how the word spirit here is a synonym or a parallel consistency with that of breath. And we see that often in Scriptures. Multiple, multiple texts that show us that spirit equals breath. Okay, so what am I saying here? I want to make this clear. Many people believe, as I'm about to show you from the Bible, and it's accurate, that when a person dies, something goes back to God. And we know that the Bible teaches that what goes back to God is the spirit of a person, right? But the question is, what is that spirit? Is it the ghost of a person? Is it the intelligent, ghostly, kind of translucent, invisible, spirit-like, ghost-like apparition that floats out of the body and then, you know, kind of, you know, drifts off into the heavenly abyss? Is that what it's talking about? We need to ask that question. And the truth of the matter is, my friends, that is not the case. That is actually a myth. Many people believe that the Bible says that the spirit goes back to God, and it does say that, but they, they, they falsely attach with that the meaning of some type of intelligent ghostly figure that's within us that goes back to God. And so here's the spirit, or here, excuse me, here's the text that I'm going to use. And this is the only text, by the way, in all the Bible that uses this language. So when you ask the question, you know, how do we know that, uh, that, that the spirit goes back to God? This is the only text in all the Bible that uses that language. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Notice what the Bible says. It says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit 
shall return unto God who gave it. Notice that. Do you have the dust as you found in, as you find in Genesis 2, 7 in this text of Ecclesiastes 12, 7? Yes, you do. So what happens at the point of death? Just as what happened when God created man, the dust returns to the ground. In other words, the body returns to the ground. But what was it that Adam needed in order to become a living soul? He needed the breath of life. But what is that breath of life? It's the spirit of life. It's the spirit of life that God breathes into the nostrils of man that he may become a living soul. So that's why you see, basically, as we're about to bring out, creation in reverse in this text. When a person dies, the dust returns to the earth as it was. And the, notice it doesn't use the word breath, but the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So when you go into the original Hebrew here, the word for spirit is the Hebrew word ruach. And what does ruach mean? It means wind, breath. It doesn't mean ghost. It doesn't mean ghostly spiritual apparition of some kind. It does not communicate that, my friends, anywhere in the Bible. That is a man-made myth. And if you're just like me, when I was first learning this, right now, I, I'm, I'm so confused. I'm thinking to myself, wait a second. That's not what I was taught. That's not what my pastor taught me. That's not what all those Bible studies said that I studied. That's not what all my, what my parents taught me. That's not, are, are they all wrong? And of course, we never want to believe that our loved ones are wrong or that our pastor could be wrong or that our church institution and their belief of the afterlife could be wrong. Oh, no. So then we allow our preconceived humanistic ideas to become the interpretation of truth the determiner of truth, the, the kind of the balance or the gauge to determine what truth is rather than what the word of God says. My friends, we just saw it very, very clearly there. The Bible makes it clear that when a person dies, it's basically creation in reverse. That breath of life that God gives us, it returns to God. And it's not some spiritual, ghostly, intelligent apparition that's somehow in us and it goes back to God and they're just kind of floating up there, you know, on clouds with Jesus and having a good time. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's the breath of life. And again, I'm not even going to try to explain that. That in and of itself is a mystery. How do you explain the breath of life? How do you explain the spirit of life that God gives someone? That, that is the nature of that is so far beyond our comprehension and understanding. I'm not even going to try to explain that. I've had people to ask me, oh, how do you explain that? What does that mean? Don't know how that, how, how do you explain that God creates and brings life into a person? You can't. You're a finite human being. Your mind is too finite and incapable of understanding and comprehending the deep spiritual things of God when it comes to the nature of man and the nature of life and how he brings it about. But one thing we can be sure about is the text of Scripture and how it describes it. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that God places a, a, an intelligent ghost or an intelligent spiritual apparition inside a person. It's just not there. It's not found anywhere in Scripture. So let me go back to my text here. Let's read again Genesis 2-7 and notice what it says again. So he formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And notice once that happened, man became a living soul. So I'm about to say something that's probably going to be shocking and it's very, very counter cultural, especially in the times that we live. But I believe that this statement is very much based on the evidence of scripture and very much truthful. So here it is. I'm going to say it. You do not have a soul. That's right. Now, I said that one time at a seminar and this lady, so sweet, so kind, she had been coming to all my meetings. And when I said that, son, she stood up out of her chair and she stormed out of there so mad because she was not about to accept what I just said. She dug her hills in the ground. She said, forget that. That's not what I believe because she thought I was teaching some heresy. I'm going to say it one more time. You do not have a soul, okay? Now, let me clarify what I mean by that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God gives you as if it's some type of substance that he places inside your body as if he's giving it to you and you kind of possess it in here somewhere. And you're just kind of walking around in this body, but it's being driven by some spiritually bad that's within you. And when you die, it just kind of goes and then pops out and goes back to heaven. That's not what the Bible communicates. So you do not have a soul. Rather, okay, here's the correct term. You are are a soul. You do not have a soul. You are a soul. Okay. 
So let's go back to our text here, our, 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 our slides. Body plus breath. Remember, man became, let's go back one slide here. Man did not, was not given a soul. What does the scripture say there? When he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. If I told you that, um, that I'm giving you a rock. Here, I'm holding a rock in my hand and I'm giving you a rock. Once I give you that rock, you can hold that rock in your hand and go, oh, you know what? Um, I, I have a rock in my hand. Therefore, it's in my possession. I have a rock. But if I said to you, now that I've given it to you, you are a rock. Okay, now you're going to say, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not the rock, Ryan. I, I have a rock. I'm in possession of the rock. Here it is. Okay, that exact opposite thinking is how it works with the man having a soul. Man does not have a soul. God did not give man a, a soul to possess. He made him a living soul. That's why the Bible never talks about a dead soul. In other words, a, a, a dead soul that lives. In other words, someone who's died, but they continue on living. The Bible does not communicate such a thing. And that's why I remind us here, body plus breath equals a living soul. And so everything I've just said usually confuses people. And so I want to clarify this because some people are still going to hear everything that I just said and say, I disagree with you. I believe that we have a soul. I believe it goes back to God and, you know, it, it's got intelligence. It's got awareness. It's got, it's got understanding and it's up there with God, you know, at the point of death. Well, it's interesting because if that's the case, and again, many people believe that that soul or that spirit is immortal. In other words, it's going to live in one or two places in the end. It's going to live forever in the presence of God, or it's going to live forever in the presence of damnation or hellfire, right? That's, that's the traditional Christian belief. But uh, if that's the case, if the soul is immortal, then what do we do with this text right here? Ecclesiastes, or excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. <laughs> can, can, a, can a immortal soul die? Well, according to traditional Christian belief, that's not the case, right? No, it's immortal. It's going to go on and live. But yet, if we interpret it from the traditional Christian perspective, that a soul is immortal, then this text right here flies in the face of everything that we would believe about that immortal soul, that it cannot die. But yet, right here, God says, the soul that sins, it will die. And I think that this goes on to support exactly what I have been saying from the beginning that a soul is not some ghostly apparition or some you know, you know, translucent, in, invisible substance within the body, my friends, that has intelligence. No, 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 no. The soul is a living being. I'm, you're looking, I'm a living soul right now. You all that are watching this are living souls. So yes, if I sin and I continue to live in sin and you continue, the Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. Now, is that a correct statement? You better believe that's a correct statement because the wages of sin is death, according to the Bible. So as we have made clear, death is creation in reverse. So this idea that we have something within us that is spiritual, that's intelligent, that has memories, that has understanding, that goes on to, you know, to be with God or to be in hellfire forever and ever. My friends, we're going to learn as we continue through this study that that is not the case. In fact, let's go on to support what I'm saying in that manner. We're going to ask the question of the hour right now, and that is the question of, do we go anywhere when we die? And I think there's a few texts that we can answer this with. First of all, I'm going to take you to Acts chapter 2. Peter is preaching, right? He's preaching on, a, on the day of Pentecost. And in the middle of his sermon, my friends, notice what he says here. In the middle of his sermon, he brings up the patriarch David, King David. Yes, the one who slayed Goliath. Now, I don't know about you, but let's just assume for a moment that we've just, I mean, this, this is just an example, just an illustration. Let's assume for a moment that you really do have this spiritual ghost-like substance in you that, that floats and is in the eternal presence of God or in another bad place forever and ever and ever and ever and ever to infinity and beyond. Let's assume that that's true. Wouldn't you assume, and I would assume this too, based on faith, right? Based on what we read. The Bible says that David, while he made mistakes, while he did do some bad things in his youth, that he was a very spiritual man. In fact, God described him as a man after his own heart. I don't know about you, 
But when I get to heaven, I expect to see King David there so I can, you know, hear him play that amazing harp and to ask him some questions about all of his ventures and things that he experienced. I expect to see King David there. But what's interesting is to, uh, almost more than 1,000 years after David has died, notice what Peter says on the day of Pentecost, having just received the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says here. He says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both buried, excuse me, dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So he's acknowledging that David's been dead, he's dead, his sepulcher is with us. So we know that at this time, if you look at the time frame, David died like 1,000 years before Peter is giving this presentation. This brother's been dead for 1,000 years. So according to Christian tradition, that would mean that David's been in heaven with Jesus for a thousand years, or been in heaven with God for a thousand years, right? But notice what Peter says. He says, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Now, I actually had somebody once, you know, say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe Peter didn't have all the information. Oh, I don't think that's right. Because this brother had just received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit was all over this brother. And he was preaching like a boss, the gospel of Jesus. And so he was making that statement under the inspiration and guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I think the Holy Spirit would know something about what happened to David and where he's been. And so according to that text, David was dead and buried a thousand years before, but he had not even ascended into the heavens. Why? Because as we're about to find out, my friends, he was asleep in the grave awaiting the resurrection of Jesus. Let's continue on. So we're asking the question, do those who die go anywhere? Well, according to, De according to Peter, no, that's not the case. So we're going to ask an even more clear question. Do those who die continue to have conscious thoughts after death? Now, the reason why I'm asking this is because many people, again, kind of attach to the concept of death and the afterlife. They attach this idea that when a person dies, well, they're immortal, right? Their soul is immortal. Their spirit is immortal. So they go on. And even though they're no longer in the body, they're present with the Lord, which means they're intelligently aware. They're consciously aware to think things, to believe things, and to, to act, to do, and to praise the Lord in heaven, and you know, to look down and watch on their loved ones and all these things. So again, that, that is a communication of conscious awareness. And the question I'm asking here is, do those who die continue to have conscious thoughts after death? Notice what the Bible again teaches. And we're going into Ecclesiastes, excuse me, let me pull this back up. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, starting with verse 5, notice what the Bible says. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. It says, neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. In other words, their memories, their thoughts, their ideas, they're gone. They've perished. They're asleep in the grave. Notice what he continues to say in verse six. He says, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So when someone communicates to me, it says, and I know I, I've, I mean, there was once a time when I kind of had these spiritualistic thoughts, you know, because we try to comfort people with things like this. We'll say, you know, hey, you know, I, I know, like, for instance, I'll just give you, I'll give you an idea. My mother died last year. I lost my mother. And um, my first and only ever funeral that I've ever preached was my mother's funeral. And, um, but, but that's, that's kind of irrelevant to what I'm about to say. The point I'm making is I had many people communicate to me, whether it was through message, whether it was through in person or whatever. I had many people communicate to me to try to comfort me by saying, oh, you know, Ryan, your, your mother, she's, she, she is, she's gone. She's gone to be with the Lord. And, you know, just know that she's in heaven looking down upon you. Just know that she's watching over you. And that when that, when that sunlight just hits you perfect at your cheek or that, that breeze of wind just comes just right, just perfect, right, just know that that's the presence of your mother watching over you. Things like that, that Christians believe. Christians express these type of things. Not because it's necessarily rooted and grounded in Scripture, but because it's something that we would like to believe, right? When, you know, there's many of us, even in our carnal nature, we would like to believe that, right? Oh, my my, my dead loved ones are watching me. But yet, what does the Bible say? My mother loved me very much. I know that. But notice what the scripture says. Her love has perished. 
Any hatred that she might have had, it's gone. Envy, it's gone. Why? Because neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So let's continue reading. I'm not finished yet. It says, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, uh uh-oh, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And so that idea, again, I've been to many different funerals, many different funerals in my life. And the preacher goes, you know, again, they're trying to bring bring comfort. They're trying to bring, uh, you know, uh, some a sense of comfort and peace to the minds of the family members who have lost their loved one. And they'll say things like, you know, well, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so was, was a good Christian man. And yes, even though he's not with us anymore, Praise the Lord. He's up in heaven today and he's looking down upon us and he's in heaven praising the Lord. And don't worry about him. He's dancing the streets of gold, right? Things like that. And so it's interesting that, again, the Bible does not communicate such a thing. In fact, it communicates right the opposite. Notice what the Bible says here in Psalm 115, 17. It says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. And I even have Christians, and my friends, this is where we're getting into the bulk and the importance of this message. What I'm about to say to you next and what I'm about to present from the scripture is really the main reason, and it's going to connect to Thursday night's topic of hellfire, the destruction of the wicked, and many of the other topics that we're going to talk about before, or the content that we're going to talk about before we end. This is important you get this. Why is it important to know this information? Why is it important to know the truth about this topic? Someone may be watching right now and say, you know what, Ryan, what does it really matter? If I want to believe my loved ones in heaven looking down upon me, or perhaps maybe my mother, you know, visits me often in spirit form to comfort me and to, to communicate with me and to love me. And, but what does it matter either way if I want to believe that or not? That's not really a salvational issue. And I've had people present that to me, but I'm going to beg the different. I'm going to submit to you that it is very important. I don't know of anyone who wants to willfully be deceived by the devil. I don't know of anyone who willfully wants to be deceived by the devil. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't never met anyone like that. But my friends, I'm going to read this next text. And then we're going to talk just briefly about why it's important that we have an under, a proper understanding of the afterlife and the concept of the state of the dead in these last days. Let me, let me read this text text to you. And then we're going to talk about it. This comes from Job chapter 7, verse 9. Notice what it says. As the cloud is consumed away and vanishes away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. It's talking about spirit. The, 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 the once a person has died, they're not going to come up out of that grave to revisit the living. Notice what it continues to say. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. What is that saying? Well, we're fast approaching Halloween. This is a proper topic to be discussing on the brink of, 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 a, of a, ho- a holiday where people believe in dead spirits and you know all these other things that people dress up like and believe in. My friends, do you know how many people on, on such nights like Halloween actually come together? Witches. And, and sorcerers and people who believe and practice in necromancy or the belief in the afterlife and the dead who practice seances and all these things. Do you know what they're doing? This is real stuff. This is not no fake stuff. They're coming together and they're believing on such times like this and such meetings that they can conjure up the spirits to communicate them because they believe again in a spirit realm that beyond this afterlife, before, but beyond what we can see and feel and think in this world, there's a spirit realm where they can communicate with dead people, dead spirits. I know hundreds of Christians that believe this, Christians who believe this. And what's amazing is right there in the word of God, God says, do not go and, and, and concern yourself and, and ask for the, uh, for the works and for the help of a witch. Do not conjure up spirits to speak to that. In fact, for, if anybody did that back in the day, God told Moses, he said, take them out and stone them. Why? Because let me just give it to you clear. They're not communicating with actual spirits of people who have died. Who are they communicating with? The Bible says that in the last days, you can read this in Revelation chapter 16. You can even read it in Matthew chapter 24. The idea that in the last days, along with the devil who's eating those demons, will work miracles to deceive, if possible, the very elect. 
that they will go about working wonders and signs and miracles. I wonder what's amongst those miracles and those wonders and those signs that they're doing. Think about it. God's trying to lead someone along the truth of his word, but the devil doesn't want them. So what's one powerful way to really pull someone out of the way of the Lord? Conjure up the dead spirit of their loved one, who, they're miss, who they miss so much, who they just want to just feel again and see again and hear again and touch again and hold again and listen to their voice and to smell the perfume and the colognes that they, all of these things that's personal to them. The devil conjures up a spirit that looks like your loved one, sounds like your loved one, smells like your loved one, feels like your loved one. Uh-oh, it must be your loved one, right? The Bible says that the dead know not anything. They go down into the grave. They sleep until the appointed time of resurrection. But guess what? The devil's working miracles. And we live in a day and age, my friends, where the devil is working these miracles left and right. I have a loved one who you've heard of Ouija boards. What is a Ouija board all about? My friends, if you have a Ouija board, go burn it. Get rid of it. Because if you've ever had this type of experience, and I'm sure there's probably someone watching right now that has had some type of experience like this, let me tell you something. It may have sounded like your loved one. It may have looked, maybe even whatever, appeared, smelled, whatever. Oh, but Ryan, it would just, it, that was their voice. I know that was their voice. Of course, do you not think that the devil can work these type of miracles? Of course he can. He did it with King Saul when he conjured up what he thought was the spirit of Samuel when he went to the witch of Endor, go read the scripture. The Bible doesn't say that that was actually Samuel the prophet. It says that, it says that the witch, okay, and Saul in this experience, that he perceived that it was Samuel the prophet. It didn't say, did they wear that? Does it say, oh, that was Samuel the prophet? No, 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 no. It says he perceived that it was Samuel the prophet. But who really was it that, that he was communicating with? The devil himself. And you know what that one instance cost Saul? Not only his kingship, but his life in the end. God punished him because he told him not to do it and he did it anyways. Why? Because God's trying to protect his people. He's trying to protect us from the deceptions and the power of the enemy. But we got people up here in Christianity today that are believing all kinds of spiritualistic things that is not rooted and grounded in the Bible, my friends. Let's continue on. I want to ask the question of the hour. If Jesus is our example, what did Jesus believe about death? How did Jesus describe death? Well, let's look and see what the Bible actually teaches. So this is the experience of Jesus resurrecting Lazarus, okay? So notice what's happening. He's walking down the road, and this is, the, this is what we find in the Scripture about the story of Lazarus, who has died at this point. It says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus, what's the word he uses here? Sleepeth, okay? But I go that I may wake him out of sleep. So I want you to notice right off the cuff, Jesus knows that Lazarus is really dead. He's gone. That brother's been wrapped and buried and put in a tomb. Jesus knows this. But how is Jesus likening death? What words is he using to liken it to death? He's using the word sleep, okay? He sleepeth, that I go, that I may wake him out of his sleep. Now, the disciples haven't really, they haven't really picked up on this language yet. And you think that they would because the Old Testament scriptures are flooded with you know, people who have died, they use the word, you know, he went and slept with his fathers. He went and slept with the father, slept with the father, slept with the father. Anytime you read that in Old Testament scripture, you know, the king went and slept with the father. It's talking about death. He went to sleep in the grave with those other kings who had died. That being said, let's go back to the text now. Notice the response of the disciples. It says, then has said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep, right? They thought, Jesus, what in the world? We're going to turn around. We're going to go, we're going to go visit Lazarus. This brother's taking a nap. Then you're going to go wake him out of sleep. Let that brother sleep. You don't need to, you don't need to go wake him up out of his sleep. Let's continue on with our mission. But then notice what the Bible says. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I can imagine at that moment it hit them. Oh my, Jesus was talking about him being really dead all that time, but he said that he's sleeping. Now Jesus has arrived at the scene, and notice what happens here. He meets up with his sister, uh, Lazarus' sister, Martha. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. And this is the old English language. The other translations will say something along the lines of, you know, Martha comes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, because she knows the healing power of Jesus, right? She's seen it. She knows about it. And so she's basically making a statement of faith. Oh, Lord, if you would have come sooner, you know, he wouldn't have died. You could have just spoke the word, touched him, do what you do to make sure that he doesn't die. And so she's making that statement of faith. Lord, I know that he would not have died if you'd have been here. 
But then notice the response of Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother is in heaven. He's way up there in the clouds with Jesus. Girl, why in the world would you want him to come back to this wicked place? He's dancing up there in heaven, walking the streets of gold. He's having a good old time. Look, your brother's in heaven watching you from above. He's with you in spirit. Just don't worry about it. He's in a better place. Is that what the text says? Notice how Jesus, the living Son of God, could have bestowed all kinds of amazing uh, uh, comfort and peace upon this woman by saying, hey, Martha, look, girl, have you not heard? Have you not heard? Girl, he's in a better place. He's up there. He's walking the streets of gold. He's in his mansion. He's talking with the prophets. I just saw him just, you know, before I came, you know, I'm, I'm, you know my father's told me all about what he's doing. You know, he, he's good. Everything's good. No, 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 no. Notice the language again. He says, thy brother shall rise again. Okay, now notice Martha's response. Powerful. Notice her faith response. She says, I know that he shall rise again. Where? In the resurrection at the last day. Notice this sister's walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus. She's been in many of his sermons, many of his teachings. She would have surely heard him say something about, you know, spirits being in heaven and, you know, coming out of bodies and, you know, going and being with. No, 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 no. What was her statement of faith? She could have right there said, oh, Jesus, I, I know that he's in a better place. I, I know that he's in heaven. I just wish he was back here with me. No, 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 no. What was her statement of faith? I know. Here it is again. Let me pull it back up here. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And of course, we know Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And we know those famous words. Remember, he walks up to the tomb and he, he, he announces those special words to, to bring forth the Lazarus. Remember? Remember what he said? He said, Lazarus, come on down right? Lazarus, just come on down. <laughs> I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. I'm just simply alluding to the idea that if many Christians believe that, as I once did, then why in the world would Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth? If he's up there, he should say, hey, Lazarus, come on down here. That's not what he says, though. And he certainly wasn't, you know, in the bad place in hellfire. Otherwise, he would have said, hey, brother, you need to come on up out of there, right? No, no, no. He says, Lazarus, come forth, all right? Now, I want to zoom back in on this as we're preparing to close this presentation. We're getting to the end of this presentation here, okay? So notice this very closely. My question is this. When she says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day, where does she get this idea from? Where would she have gotten the idea that in order for her to see her brother again, he would need to be resurrected? And notice there's a time frame involved at the last day. She would have gotten this from Jesus himself because notice the chapter here. We're reading from John chapter 11. A few chapters before in John chapter six, notice what Jesus says, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in the same discourse. He says, and this is the father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Notice it again a second time. Everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And when will he get that everlasting life? When will, he, when will he receive it? Not immediately when he dies. It says, and I will raise him up at the last day. Here's the third time. It says, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And of course, the fourth time here. Whosoever eateth my flesh, of course, this is spiritual language here. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, he hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the what? At the last day day, my friends. This is the exact same language that Paul would communicate when we go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what Paul says about the second coming of Jesus, my friends. Notice, notice the language Paul even uses, okay? And by the way, let me set the context of this. The reason why Paul writes what we're about to read here 
is many of the Christians at Thessalonica had been writing to Paul, had been communicating to Paul and saying, oh man, look, you know, you've told us all about, you know, the second coming and how Jesus is going to come back and he's going to get his people. But, you know, if Jesus comes back anytime soon, what about all of our loved ones, the believers who have went to sleep in Jesus in the grave? What about them? Are they going to get to come with us or are they just going to be left behind in the graves? Notice what Paul responds when he's writing back to them in regards to death and the second coming of Jesus. He says here, he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. And then notice what he continues to say here. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now notice the context of this here. He says, which God will bring with him. Many people take this text right here that you see on the screen, and they try to use that to say, see, Christ is in heaven, and so are all of my loved ones and all of the saints who have died. They're in heaven, and when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring them with him from heaven. That's not what this text is saying. G Paul is not addressing the fact of the saints that have went to heaven. Otherwise, he would have said that in, in the passage here. He would have said, hey, look, brother, whoo, don't, don't worry. Hey, you're worried about them. They're already in heaven. We're going to meet them when we get there. No, 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 no. What he's addressing is the fact, let's go back to that text here, is that when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring those dead loved ones who are in the graves. He's going to resurrect them and bring them also with those who are alive, and we will all meet the Lord in the air together. Now, how do I know that? Because the very next few verses, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 16, speaking of the second coming of Jesus. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then notice what it says. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up after them. No, no, no. It says we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, notice, shall we ever be with the Lord? Do you know what this text is saying? I'm so excited about this right now. My mother, who is asleep in the grave right now, awaiting the resurrection, she doesn't get to go to heaven before me. Woo! Me and my mother, whom I love so much, and I believe in faith and trust that we'll be in heaven because I saw her give her heart to Jesus before she died last year. My friends, my mother and me at the same time are going to place our feet on the sea of glass together, and we're going to wonder about the beauty and the majesty of heaven together. I'm not going to show up in heaven and mom just be like, yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been here for a little while. Let me give you a tour. Let me show you over here. Now, okay, so that's Abraham's mansion. All right, now, obviously, this is my favorite spot here. I like this one. Now, Isaac's way over there. Now, come over here. I'll show you the tree of life. No, 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 no. We're caught up together at the second coming of Jesus to meet the Lord in the air together. And then so shall we all together be with him. Oh, my friends, that's so powerful. And that's exactly essentially what Paul is communicating here. In fact, notice what he says at the end of this passage. He says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We have so many brothers and sisters, my friends, so many brothers and sisters that are being comforted with lies. They're being told lies about what's actually happening to their, to their loved ones who have passed on. What's actually, and so they're being comforted with lies. My friends, what does Paul say? Not to comfort them with lies, but with the words that he just spoke. We should comfort each other with these words. What are those words? We should be telling people that, hey, hey, guess what? Even though your loved one is asleep in Jesus in the grave right now, Jesus is going to return back one day and he's going to shake this world and he's going to resurrect your loved one and you will be united with them and you will both get to meet the Lord in the air together and you will be with the Lord together together forever in his kingdom. That's the words that we should comfort one another with. Not with, you know, oh, you know, and she's watching over you and, you know, no, that's not what the Bible teaches, my friends. And we have to be clear on this. I love the passage also that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice what he says. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. There it is. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. When? In the moment 
twinkling of an eye immediately at the point of death? No, no, no. When do we receive immortality? When are we changed from, from mortal to immortal? It says, at the last trump. And then he confirms it. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Mm, that's it, my friends. That's the truth about death. And so the question is, the question of the hour I have to ask, you see, why, this is just, this is, to me, this is just a simple, clear question that has to be asked, has to be answered. Why would God allow my dead loved one to go to heaven before me, for one? And number two, um, why would he resurrect them at the end of the world if they're already in heaven? That didn't even make any sense. Like as if Jesus is going to come together with all of the saints that apparently are there in heaven. He like, you know, maybe a couple of minutes before he comes back and says, hey, look, guys, look, look, I'm about to send you back to your bodies. And then I'll raise you back up again in just a couple of minutes. That doesn't even make any sense, my friends. And it's unbiblical. So that's the truth, my friends, the beautiful truth, beautiful truth. I heard, I heard a story. I have to tell this as we're closing here. I heard a story of a young lady. She was... Uh, she had died in a car accident and a young, young lady, I think she was in high school and, and a beautiful story. I just love telling this story because it brings so much hope. And uh, of course she was very loved by her classmates, um, very much honored by her classmates. And so on the day of her funeral, many of the classmates came to her funeral and the parents and the family allowed, they, they had had a marker there, a mat, like a, some type of you know, permanent marker. And they allowed each student to come up to the casket with the lid, while the lid was open, and they allowed them to write a message on the inside of the casket, whether they wanted to just sign their name or write a little message of some kind. And one of her close friends, who was a Christian, who believed the truth of, about death from the Bible, she wanted to be one of the first ones up there so she could have the best spot, right? So that when that lid was closed right over the face of that deceased body, that she wanted her message to be the very first message that that young girl would see as soon as she opened her eyes at the resurrection. And so it's a powerful what she wrote. And she wrote right there in big, bold letters, right there above her head, right there in front. She wrote really bold. If you are reading this, you are about to see Jesus. <laughs> oh man, that is so powerful. And so that's the hope we have. That's the blessed hope that even though we die and we sleep in the grave, it, you know, it's amazing because many people think there's going to be some consciousness in the grave. There is no consciousness in the grave. When a person dies, it's literally going to be to the dead like a millisecond later and they're going to see Jesus. Like you and I, you know, you're, my mother's been, I mean, she's been dead now for, you know, well over a year and a half, almost two years. And so it's not like she's down there sleeping and she has this conscious awareness of time. No, 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 no. From the moment that God took her breath, the breath of life, and she breathed her last breath, she went to sleep, she's unconscious, and it's going to be literally like she just woke up from a sleep. And the very next millisecond thought she's going to have is she's going to feel and see the ground shake. And she's going to come out of that grave. And Jesus is going to change her vile body into a glorious body like his. It's going to be glorious, my friends. That's the truth of God's word about death. That's the hope that we have. We don't need to believe in lies. We just need to believe what the Bible